First, there's no existing homes for sale in the United States, and baby boomers are going to, thanks thanks to COVID, are going to live in their house till they die. You know, business, friends, you name it. I got like 800 friends on Facebook, and I need to hire somebody to do the birth, birthday wishes each day. Jeff Bezos announces what I consider to be the biggest mistake he ever made in business, which was buying Whole Foods. The, the, the more they shame it, the more difficult they make it to poke holes in the ground, the, the, the more there's going to be an explosion in price because I didn't have the size to be what I wanted to be in athletics. And, uh, and so I, I just kind of transferred that competitive nature uh, into the investment business. Hi, I'm Steve Clapham. Welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world at large. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Bill Smead is a value investor who's been in the business for over 40 years. His firm now manages around $5 billion using a long-term concentrated value strategy. Bill likes to own stocks for a long time. His average holding period is over six years, and he tries to buy high quality businesses when they're out of favor. This isn't a traditional value approach, but as an example, he held Accenture for 20 years. Rather, his is an idiosyncratic, pragmatic, deeply fundamental approach to investing founded in eight core tenets, which every stock in the portfolio must adhere to. He likes investing themes. He talks a lot about demographics in this interview. I learned a lot in this podcast. I learned something about greyhound racing, which is more complex than I'd realized. I learned why millennials may move a lot more in the US in the next decade. And I learned what Philip Morris and the oil and gas sector have in common. This conversation was focused on stocks and in making money. And Bill has a pithy comment and the bon mot for every occasion. And I think you will find his commentary quite hilarious. I certainly did. I know you're going to enjoy this episode. And just to emphasize, we recorded this in the summer. Bill's discussion of stocks is not investment advice. Please do your own research. Bill, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you. And I always ask people, did you always want to be an investor? Well, I, I always wanted to be someone that took uh, high probability risks. I, I grew up in a family of poker players, card players, uh, uh, gamblers, uh, greyhound handicappers, and uh, along the way, got the bug for taking risks that were well thought out. Greyhounds. Yeah, it, it it ironically, the greyhound handicapping was something two of my cousins attempted to do uh, professionally, and I was working swing shift at the Crown Zellerback Paper Mill, and Smith bought uh, uh, that that paper mill, and uh, uh, I started handicapping the greyhounds. Well, I figured out that there were five variables that were the most important in those greyhound races. Uh, uh, class of animal, uh, in other words, who, who had they beaten before, uh, early speed, late speed, post position, and what I called the Janet Jackson uh, criteria, which is, you know, how have you been running lately? Ooh. <laughs> and uh, so, so I handicapped greyhounds. Ironically, in 1985, I was at Drexel Burnham. We brought a, a closed end fund public, the Z7 fund. And this guy, Barry Ziskin, had uh, uh, seven criteria for stock selection. And uh, that was the beginning of us coming up with the eight criteria. So I thought, well, I had this criteria for selecting which 
uh, Greyhound to bet on, I should have a criteria for deciding which socks I should buy. That's a, that's very very interesting. And how old were you when you came up with these five criteria for the Greyhound? And how did you think about what cr the criteria should be? Well, it it just evidenced itself. It, uh, the the it was an oblong track, and early speed was very important because the centrifugal force would cause the dogs to bang into each other going around the first corner. If, if you got knocked off your tea kettle, you, you, you were not going to win the race. And, and you were, you're interested in who was going to be first and second place out of nine greyhounds. So the class, it, it would be like quality, the quality factor in common stock investing. That's class is, is what that is. Uh, early speed was incredibly important for clearing that first corner. Uh, late speed was useful because most of the dogs had early speed. They were bred to have early speed. And so if you had late speed, that was a great differentiator, uh, for dogs. Uh, and, and, uh, so, and then post position was very important because these, these greyhounds would demonstrate that there was a certain part of the track. They liked to run around. Oh, and really? they would, oh, they would, they would find that part of the track. So let's say they like to run around the outside of the track. You put them in the one box, the inside box, and they'll work their way to the outside of the track, which means they wasted time. They, oh, they wait, yeah. right? So, it, so if you were in the nine hole and you were a rail runner, you could bet on them if they were an early speed dog, because then they could beat the others to the rail. But for the most part, you wanted them in the one or two or three hole. So did you weight these different factors or it was just an equally weighted kind of? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because in that world, if you were at the track in the 20 minutes leading up to the race, people were putting their bets out a and, and what odds you were being given on those factors was a big part in the thing. A and it reminds me, of I try to explain to people why David Svensson, the, the, the guy that ran the Yale endowment, was so successful with the pivot that he did in 1999. So think of it like this. Let's say there was 11 major uh, asset classes that, that Yale's endowment could invest in. Well, uh, 10 of the 11 were, 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 uh, were deeply out of favor and one, and by the way, that's where we are right now again, the, the one asset class was going off at one point, one, one to two odds. And then the other 10 were all anywhere from 30 to 99 to one. That would be, you know, everything else. Uh, and, and so what happened was he looked like such a genius because he took an enormous amount of money out of the favorite category, which at that time was technology and the S and P 500 index. And he spread that money across the other, uh, you know, the other 10 greyhounds in the race that were going off at huge odds. And as they succeeded the next 10 to 20 years, he looked like a genius. And that was the, you know, the birth of the popularity of asset allocation. No, it's an interesting comparison. Now you mentioned Janet Jackson and you use lyrics to pop songs a lot in your letters and i i i would love to do that but i find it really difficult how do you find the right song do you just have one of these sort of photographic memories that you can remember the, the all the lyrics i frustrate my wife all the time I, I can't remember to take out the garbage and i can tell you everything that went on every month for the last 43 years in the United States stock market. Uh, I can tell you who was winning, who was losing, why they were winning, why they were losing, wh which is one of the reasons why I, I'm so adamant about our positions right now. I, I, in effect, trusting the rhymes of economic history uh, are one of the things that, that you absolutely have to do for, for successful long-term performance. And right now, uh, all the capital has placed the opposite of what economic history would tell you. Yeah, no, I, I we're going to, we're going to come to that, but before we get, get to that, I just want to, to understand how did you start using lyrics in your letters? Was it just, did it just happen? Did you just one day you went, Oh, that was. Well, I, I, I love music and I love, uh, uh, 
uh, movies. Uh, and, and so it, it, you just know that for a large part of your readership, they might not be as sophisticated uh, as, uh, uh, as, as other uh, uh, investors might be. And it's a way for them to work in. I can work in their world. I'll speak to them in a language that they appreciate uh, to understand the concept that I'm working on. No, it's very, and it's very, it's, it's very effective. And you also have a podcast, a book with legs, which obviously from the Charlie Munger quote. How did that come about? What was the genesis of that? Well, that's that's my my son Cole, our, my co portfolio manager. Uh, he, he has driven that whole thing. Uh, uh <laughs> you know, Munger's family called him a book with legs cause he always had his face in a book. And, uh, uh, so, uh, again, to learn the history of the markets, the, the, uh, to understand the math of the markets and understand the psychology of the markets, you, you need to look at the investing world from a multidisciplinary standpoint. And the best way to do that is to constantly be readers. So, you know, we're on Apple and Spotify and all those places with this, uh, uh, you know, audio podcast. And uh, we have a we have a, a good one. We're going to be working on uh, Greg Steinmetz wrote a book called The uh, the uh, Rich, Richest Man Ever Lived uh, about uh, Jacob Fugger, uh, which, gosh, is just a you want to talk, talk about a multidisciplinary just. A, a a feast it's a great history it's about finance it's about economics it's about religion i here i i was a huge fan of world war one and world war ii when i was in junior high and high school i read every book in the library on both of those and i never understood why a guy named ferdinand getting murdered in yugoslavia caused a world war until i read the, the book about fugger and realized that through, because of the Habsburgs and the connection between the 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 papacy and and these these uh, royal families that that they were all connected in a in a incredible way that again for a guy from the United States this was a, a revelation. It's very funny you should bring them up because I just saw last week and I just put it in my Amazon basket. I was just looking at my Amazon basket. He's written a book about Jay Gould. Yeah, we, we've podcasted. Jay Gould, we, who's one of the original crooks. And, you know, I do this forensic accounting course and we talk, we look back at past fraudsters. And I, I talk about Jay Gould and I hadn't realized somebody had written about him. So I've just put that in my in my basket. So hopefully that will be delivered in time um, for me to take away in, on a holiday. And his was a fascinating story because he tried to corner the price of gold. Yeah, it, I, I mean, it was a, like amazing thing. I mean, I'd never come across a story before and I found the story and Ulysses Grant, the president, warned him off and he carried on. And then the price of gold halved in a day in 1861, I think. Yeah. So so Greg, we were just talking to Greg yesterday and it was a lot easier to write the Gould book. Because of course, all the information he could access in English, uh, and, and uh, uh, the the Fugger book, he had to do a lot of his research in German. Oh no! Now, now he had lived in Germany. His wife is German, uh, but it. So just imagine you like the Gould book, and then just add to that 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 the guy writing the Fugger book had to do a lot of massive effort and research in in German to do the same thing and you'll love it. It, it, it's only 250 some pages, but I'm telling you, it's a feast. It is. Oh, a right. I'm going to, I'm going to add that. It, I'm going to add that to my, to my list. Who's been your favorite guest on the podcast. You, you've interviewed loads of really good authors. I had Richard, you've had Richard Oldfield on. I yes. had him on this podcast and he was brilliant. And it was quite funny because I didn't know him. I bumped into him at a conference and I said, I really loved your book. Would you come on the podcast? And he said, oh, well, actually, you know, the first book sold very well, the first edition, but we reissued it. Second edition hasn't sold at all well. So I'd love to come on the podcast. And he was brilliant. But who's yeah. been your favorite? Or are you not allowed to say? Well, I, I, I uh, uh, the, the, the ones. So Cole does 
uh, every single one. And I do the ones that he, he thinks that uh, my anecdotes add the most value. Uh, so I just, I, I've enjoyed all of them. They're, they're uh, it, it's such a great exercise. Uh, but book wise, I can just tell you that the Fugger book, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, let me, let me answer that. Uh, now that you mentioned it, there, uh, uh, a book by Robert Sirico, uh, the economics of the parables, uh, Robert Sirico is a Catholic priest in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we had the most delightful conversation and his, uh, down to earth, anybody could understand what he was getting at. Uh, just optimism was, it, it, you know, we, you, you were on a high for about a week after talking to the guy and I'm, I'm not Catholic and it, it but it's called the economics of the parables. All right. Just, okay. uh, well, we better stop talking about books because I, my Amazon basket is going to be overflowing. Uh, but what's it like working with your son? What's it like working with Cole? Uh, well, it, it, it's awesome and it's challenging uh, at the same time. Uh, you know, he's young and uh, the difference between Cole and myself is uh, I'm much more motivated by uh, proving our discipline, right? That, 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 what motivates me is, uh, is I, I, I want to compete, right? I, I, I was a frustrated athlete as a high school and college athlete, uh, because I didn't have the size to be what I wanted to be in athletics. And, uh, and so I, I just kind of transferred that competitive nature, uh, into the investment business and, and God was kind to me and got me an RIA shingle in 1993 at Smith Barney to run separate accounts. And we were raising five kids and, you know, uh, uh, raising five kids as a commission person is really a lot of pressure to come in on day one of each month at ground zero, and then to shift the entire thing over to running separate accounts and getting paid on Saturday and Sunday was uh, just a blessing. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so that, that was, uh, that was a revolution, which of course, so for 14 years, I ran separate accounts under the umbrellas of larger firms before we started, uh, uh, Smead Capital and started the fund at the beginning of 08. Now, this is an interesting thing because I did a spell working two or three days a week for a wealth manager in London. So they had a few mil a few billion under management and they had a lot of experience in the UK, but they knew much less about international equities. And they'd actually outsourced it to a third party who had quite a concentrated portfolio but then managed to underperform. And they said to me, well, you know, this doesn't seem very good. And I said, no, that's really pretty bad. And so they said, oh, well, could you come up with a model portfolio? And then, you know, the individual bankers can decide what they want to implement and, and so on, and then you can help them. And so I, I thought, well, you know, do, do that two or three days a week might be quite interesting. And what I, and they then asked me to manage some individual accounts. So, the banker actually did the buy or sell order because I wasn't authorized to do that. But I basically said, this is what you're going to do. And if you, if you didn't do it, I just said, well, that's, we're done now. So they, you know, and, but I, what struck me about this was that the wealth managers tend to be less well, well, they tend, tend not to be as good investors as the fund managers, as professional fund managers, institutional fund managers. But managing separate accounts is much more difficult. I had a nightmare because I, I started off doing it. It was really successful. So the first couple of guys, they then gave me more money, which was fine. But then they said to their friends, oh, you want to give Steve some money? And so the money all came in at different times. And when you're running a fund, you get more inflows. You just buy the cheapest stock. But when you're money running separate accounts, you you know, there's stuff that you own, but you wouldn't necessarily buy more of that. You're you know, you're thinking about the exit rather than thinking about it. I find it yeah. really difficult. It, How did Steve, you manage? Steve, you. Uh, so when we started uh, Smead Capital, uh, we hired a guy by the name of Tony Shearer, 
who had some more institutional uh, experience than, than I had uh, to uh, be a co-portfolio manager. And uh, he basically, we started a transition. I, when I was running those separate accounts, I did exactly what you were just describing. In other words, uh, when a new account came in, I would load up on the things on, on my list that appeared to be far and away the cheapest and most attractive for purchase at that moment. And, and, and so that was the positive. The positive was I knew how someone did the first two years they were going to be with me was going to be determine whether they were going to be with me for 20 or 30 years. So I was totally sensitive to trying to get them a great experience the first couple of years. Well, when we started the fund uh, and we still had the legacy separate accounts, but what we had to do was we had to create all identical accounts, a, a, a model portfolio, and everybody was going to need to own the model portfolio. And, and then secondly, the old setup, the separate account setup, I was both the financial advisor and the stock picker for those separate accounts. So we were dealing with the interface of the service side of the business with the customers. And uh, uh, that, that's why the, the, the fund managers have much better concentration because they're not interacting with the customer uh, at the customer face level. Uh, I love the people that trust us. I, there's, I've, I've got people that I've been picking stocks for 35 years for, and I, I thank God for them uh, in, in, in my prayers. They, they're great. They're still with us and, and they're being shepherded by somebody else. Uh, but uh, the symmetry of our accounts creates added pressure, right? As a, as, as a, as a man, manager of a mutual fund, uh, people look and they'll say, well, am I getting the leftovers from somebody else that's done well? Or, or and is this meritorious right now to buy into? And, and uh, we've been dealing that with that for 15 years. And the answer to that question has been when you, uh, it's usually a good time to take a look at us when we're in a little bit of a lull. But other than that, it doesn't make much difference. If you're going to stay for 10 or 20 years, it really doesn't make that much difference when you come in. No, but uh, I mean, that early experience is very is very important and if you've you know so if you what generally what i found happened was i did really well and so i got a shed load more money from a bunch of different people and i was going well actually you know the portfolio that these guys have done so well in well that was 20 percent ago and now these stocks aren't as attractive and i don't have another you know i only i was only doing this part time so that's not a good um, strategy but I just found I just thought this juxtaposition of having people spending less time less skilled people and it, I, I just find it more challenging yeah. to start from scratch all the time it's much easier to run a portfolio and people just buy the whole thing <laughs> well, Steve it, you think that's bad we have a bunch of self-imposed constrictions uh, it, it, on top of that. So you've already commented that, you, you know, uh, w we practice low turnover. Uh, we, we own a stock for an average of six or seven years. Uh, uh, we run a concentrated portfolio. Uh, uh, we believe that your portfolio is like a bar of soap. Uh, 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 if th the more you rub it, the smaller it gets. And, and, and so since that's the case, just think of, uh, in effect, what kind of uh, a voluntary pressure we put on ourselves. We, we are, we're going to let the math of the market work in our favor, which is if you buy a stock at 30 and you pay cash, the worst thing that can happen to you is to lose 30 points. If you buy a stock at 30, it goes to 90 and you sell it and then it goes to 300, you lost 210 points. What's worse, losing 30 points or losing 210 points? You, you probably saw Buffett the other day said something about, hey, really, it's been about five decisions we made in the last 50 years that made all the difference in our results. What he was trying to say was, 
the, you know, holding your winners to a fault is, you know, uh, let me give you a real world example right this moment. Uh, we were all by ourselves a year ago uh, being uh, super bullish on the home builders in the U.S. And uh, Fed tightened credit the most in a year in U.S. history. And everybody knows that the mortgage interest rate going up is going to just kill the home builders. Well, uh, the, the, the stocks are trading at five times earnings, but we've got this unbelievable combination of circumstances in their industry that are working in their favor. First, there's no existing homes for sale in the United States and baby boomers are going to, thanks, thanks to COVID, are going to live in their house till they die. Uh, and, 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 and then secondly, uh, the home builders themselves used to be land developers and they quit doing that. Now all they do is build houses on land developed by somebody else. So their balance sheets are like JP Morgan fortress like, and they don't take the risk at the peaks and the bottoms on, on their balance sheet like they used to. And then we got 92 million millennials replacing 65 million Gen Xers in, in, the, in the home buying market. And they were really slow to get started, Steve. Those millennials, you know, 30 years old is the new 23 in the United States of America. Uh, you know, uh, uh, boys stay boys until they're 30 now instead of uh, stopping at 23 like they used to. And, but now all that postponement is boom. It's, it's here. You know, you know, everybody talks about fiscal policy is why we haven't had a recession yet. Well, how about there's 40% more people between 25 and 42. It, it's just an overwhelming number of people getting their, their adult lives started in their thirties and having their kids in their thirties and their higher income and more affluent. And the grandparents are just dying for a grandbaby. So anyway, long story short, uh, those stocks have made a nice move. They've, they've doubled since a year ago, but yet they trade at 10 times earnings. The runway the next 10 years for those companies is outstanding because we've only scraped the surface of building all the houses we need to build in the United States. And the market hasn't recognized the elimination of the cyclicality that used to exist in the industry that torpedoed everybody in 06 to 012. So th therefore, uh, uh, am I happy to have a brand new uh, customer come into our mutual fund with a big position in those home builders? And the answer is, I'm just fine with that. They traded a, uh, a, a huge discount to the average stock, and they have probably better economics than the above average businesses in the S&P. This demographic thing, when we met in London and you put up that slide, I was very taken by that because I've never seen the demographic portrayed in such a, a simple and easy way. And I love that slide you had of the millennials and all the things that they were going to buy. And we know that things like having having a child is, well, anybody you've got you've had five children so you know it's an expensive business right and it creates a huge amount of spending what other knock-on effects other than the fact that the millennials have all been renting homes and when they have children they're probably going to want to own a home in the suburbs rather than rent an apartment downtown what other things i mean is are there other opportunities that spin out of this this demographic yeah, well, we own U-Haul and uh, Southwest Airlines used to have a commercial slogan. You're now free to move about the country uh, with the, the way industry is and the labor market is in the United States. Uh, people are going to spread themselves out around, around the United States. Really, all, all a millennial family needs is water and Wi-Fi, the two W's. Right. So mm -hmm. so if, if you can buy a house a uh, 3,000 square foot, four bedroom house for $400,000 in the outskirts of Kansas City. Why are you messing around trying to buy one for a million five in New Jersey? It, 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 it just doesn't make any sense because your skills travel well. You, you know, we, we have kind of a labor shortage in the United States. In fact, the labor shortage is most severe among unskilled labor. Uh, businesses that employ unskilled laborers are they're raising the pay about 10% every six to nine months to try to find uh, employees 
to work in their businesses, whether it be restaurants or, or you know, a, a wide range. And it's a good thing. It, it, it's going to eliminate some of that chasm between the, 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 you know, the inequality that we've had the last 15 or 20 years, which primarily was driven by technology stock success and, and technology company success that drove that inequality. But nobody says that in, in, in the media uh, or in the world of politics. That's what drove it. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if so, you're bound to enjoy our free newsletter on Substack. It's a weekly email I send out each Sunday morning on interesting investing related topics. Just visit BehindTheBalanceSheet.com and hit that little sign up button on the top right. And while you're there, you should check out our fabulous online investor training school. Hundreds of students have taken our flagship Analyst Academy course, which teaches you everything you need to become a serious equity investor. And if you're a professional investor, we also run a forensic accounting course for institutional clients and a cohort based course for smaller funds and for serious amateurs. Email me at info at behind the balance sheet.com for more information. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things been driving it, to be fair. I mean, a lot of it's down to financial services as well, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of yeah. it's yeah. down to dem- demographics and, 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 and people passing money on. But um, U-Haul, so you, you, you own U-Haul because you reckon people are going to move more. Yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna move around the country and they dominate. I mean, you want to talk about a wide moat? Most people can't even name the number two competitor uh, for renting a trailer or 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 a truck to uh, to move around. And skate. Uh, uh, well, that's the number two. You're in the industry. I met people. No, I'm not. In, I, I I know that as a consumer, and yeah. I'm not even American. Yeah. So so, but they're small potatoes. I can just tell you, they're they're tiny compared to U-Haul. But U-Haul is basically uh, using the same property that they, they, they rent their vehicles from. They're putting storage units in. And Americans are notorious hoarders, by the way. Uh, Americans love to buy things that they don't need, and they end up storing them. And, and so the combination of moving people about the country and hoarding uh, it, it is another chance for me to make up for the fact that I... I bought public storage stock in 1985, made some money on it and sold it and should have kept it to today. I'd be a rich, rich man if I'd kept those shares from 1985. I, I suspect, Bill, you're quite rich. But the this idea of you can't own things forever because you've got quite a concentrated portfolio, haven't you? Yeah, we, we have 26 names and uh, we, we usually have 45% or 50% in our top 10 holdings. So that's quite a concentrated portfolio by many people's standards. What are the, I mean, the opportunity is is obvious that you've got more of what you love, but you also create a bit more volatility. I mean, what, can you just talk a little bit about why 25 or 26 and not 40 and why 45% in the top 10, not 30%? You've come to this from trial and error i suspect yeah but i i read like i got 30 years ago buffett said uh you get 93 percent of the benefit of diversification at the 20th security yeah uh, and and buffett said you know uh is it likely that your 30th best idea is going to be as worthy as your 10th best idea uh it, it you know it's it's not very complex on that score sure. uh, but But we do this through a mechanism of writing our winners to a fault. So when someone looks at us, they should look at us like the producer of a play on Broadway or in London uh, or the producer of of movies. We audition actors and actresses, and we're looking for the ones that are going to win the Tony Awards and the Academy Awards. We want to. We want Jack Nicholson. We want Meryl Streep. We want Reese Witherspoon. We want to find them, and we want to stay with them uh, for the duration of their career because they just keep winning and winning and winning. And and, and so, uh, the we sell things that have worked when they get maniacal. So, for example, at the end of 2021, we looked and we said, 
I, I don't think growth has ever been this popular relative to value ever. We've got to get out of some of our growthier names. And we took a look. There were five names, three of which we got out of. We sold our Accenture that I'd owned for 20 years. We sold uh, 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 the last. Of, uh, we sold Disney, which we'd owned for 20 years, and we sold the last of our Starbucks. We looked at Home Depot and we looked at Target, and we decided because the millennials, those statistics you were referencing earlier about what the millennials are going to spend money on the next 10 years, and Target and Home Depot are in the sweet spot of that spending. So we decided to keep them. And the truth of it is, it had been a pretty good sell at the end of 2021 to have sold Home Depot and Target also, and then bought them back now uh, uh, to take advantage of the millennials, but we didn't. Uh, but anyway, so we will sell maniacal pricing. We'll sell stocks that we've owned for a while that, that we decide we're wrong on, right? We'll purge what we think we're wrong on. Uh, and then if, if, if some of our... Uh, eight criteria get violated, like if H and R Block loses its moat due to TurboTax, or or uh, you know, or if if the balance sheet deteriorates and there's no way to make it up through free cash flow, we will sell a stock because of 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 it uh, having deteriorated in our our eight criteria. But that's the three ways we get out of a stock. So let's talk about the eight criteria. You um over the entire holding period, each holding is required to meet an economic, why am I saying this? Why don't you say it? Tell us about your eight criteria. You've got five things that you must have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, think about it, meet an economic need. Just think how much grief that would save everyone if they just only bought part of a company that was going to meet an economic need. Well, what just about Netflix? Uh, or Facebook uh, or Meta, whatever it calls itself this week. Well, uh, it, it, in in their case, well, first of all, people do like to be entertained. No, sure. So, yeah. so, so, and there's good money in entertaining people. So, but let's just take Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, my daughter-in-law called me, probably 2011, 2012. She said, Grandpa. Uh, you're going to, you're, I'm going to put pictures of your grandchild. It's our first grandchild that I'm going to put pictures of our, our, our grandchild up on the, on Facebook. You should get on this thing. So I signed up, I got downloaded Facebook. I got on there. And so I could look at my grandkids. Well, within about four or five years, I've got like 800 high school, college, uh, you know, business, friends, you name it. I got like 800 friends on Facebook and I need to hire somebody to do the birth birthday wishes each day. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, and so, forth. so is it addictive? It, you know, what, what, what was that a great, uh, uh, business, uh, for a while? The, an the answer is yes. Now what happened to me, uh, in that, is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, there are great businesses that we don't want to own. Like my mom died younger than she should have because of smoking. So I've just never had any interest in owning Philip Morris, even though as a value buyer like myself, that's probably been as good or better a stock to own my 43 years in the business. Uh, Peter Lynch, you wouldn't know who he was if Philip Morris hadn't been his largest position. And, and by the way, Steve, remind me to connect that up uh, uh, Philip Morris with what's going on in the oil and gas business right now before we get done. So, so uh, uh, there's businesses I don't want to be involved in. Well, in the process of having those 800 friends, I, I realized that my college friends were putting their personal politics into Facebook in a big way. And it was, uh, uh, it was a real eye opener because in the 2016 was it yeah 16 in 2000 no 2018 election a fraternity brother of mine ran for the united states senate in montana as a republican and during the primary season some fellow friends from my own alma mater uh, uh put out on facebook that he was a trump guy and attempted to smear him 
He lost the primary 33,000 to 32,000. This is a highly respected 25 year judge in the state of Montana. Uh, and he lost in the primary 33,000 to 32,000. And then the guy that beat him took John Tester three days. It was the last Senate seat called the closest rate in the race in the United States of America. The guy that just barely beat him uh, lost in an in in incredibly close race. So the moral of the story, if Facebook hadn't existed, my fraternity brother would probably be a United States senator. Now, I don't care what party you like in politics, be it left or right. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have somebody you went to college with be a United States senator, regardless of what party it is, and be able to write him a letter and say, hey, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. in three weeks. And I've got this subject that I, could I have 15 minutes of your time? And I thought, you know what? I think there's something wrong here. And what I think is wrong, Steve, with fa Facebook is I believe there's 50 relationships in your life that are really important. And Facebook builds your life around superficial, unimportant relationships. A and it's very, very damaging, in my opinion. And so I'm not a Facebook fan, as you might be able to figure out. I, I, I have to echo those sentiments i mean i've never you know i'm i've got a facebook account and we use facebook to advertise our online school because advertising is very effective you know because you can capture the demographics it's particularly if you've got data um and i i think that's really quite cool and i don't know why people so i've been writing it off but as a as a as a user i don't see any economic need but anyway let's let, let's leave aside that the next one is moats competitive yeah. advantage how do you gauge that i love you asking that question uh we were talking about morningstar earlier yeah and morningstar tried to come up with a mathematical formula for measuring moats in my opinion was one of the silliest things i've ever seen in fact i was embarrassed when i looked at what they how they decided what they have a moat rating. Most moats are virtually intellectual in nature. They're not mathematical in the slightest. If you like the taste of Coca-Cola better than you like the taste of Pepsi, you are a Coke drinker. If you like walking out of a Starbucks store carrying that cup and, and, and because that logo makes you feel better about yourself, it, that is not measurable mathematically. And, and most moats are like that. If you're a college educated woman in the United States of America, you like to shop at Target. Now you can't measure that mathematically. Well, it well, just I, I, no, I actually disagree because you can measure the returns and you measure it, the returns versus the peers. And if the returns are higher, you can ask yourself, well, why is that? And if that's because they make higher gross margins because they've got higher selling prices, then that could be evidence of a moat. I'm not trying to defend Morningstar doing it mathematically, because I, I agree with you. It's a, it's a philosophical exercise. It's something so, about the product or about the, but the, but the, we're in the, we're in the financial business and we can measure returns. But, but Steve, at the time we want to be a buyer, it's almost always a time of tribulation for that particular company. In other words, can they get back their position that caused their normally high profit margins and their normally high return on equity? So let me give you an example. So, so Jeff Bezos announces what I consider to be the biggest mistake he ever made in business, which was buying Whole Foods. The reason they did it is... Amazon is a revenue growth story. The people that like the stock like the revenue growth story. And so he has to constantly find new sources of revenue to, to build the revenue growth story. So he looked at the $400 billion of annual revenues in the United States in groceries and said, hey, let's attack that and, and give people the fantasy that we're going to be a big factor in that business. Well, they crushed Walmart and they crushed Target and they crushed Kroger stock. Here was the king of cut to kill. J. Uh, John D. Rockefeller, 
was going to come in and cut the kill. And there is no, there is no John Sherman around. There is virtually no one in the body politic with enough political power to recognize that these widest moat businesses, and we've already talked about a few of them so far, are cutting to kill. And they're using information in a way that makes them uh, uh, unfair to compete with. Uh, and, and so there's nothing to stop it. But what he did, he woke up Target and he woke up Walmart to kick their competitive advantage against him, which is the logistics business is a nightmare. Just ask FedEx, just ask UPS. They're telling you right now that logistics are a nightmare. It's not a good idea to deliver uh, uh, things at your door at a loss. It, it's not a good idea. And, and what he did was he said, hey, you've got 1,500 stores within 20 minutes of 75% of the U.S. population. Why don't you become a big factor in e-commerce? And so they both did. And, and, and he woke them up. And so we bought into Target. And the stock had been torpedoed and all those positive things you mentioned about the, the what usually the moat for target meant had temporarily disappeared because Amazon was was cutting to kill. And, and, and now it, it uh, they have other problems at the moment. But the truth of it is, that was a splendid stock for us uh, buying it in the 50s uh, and in, in the spring, late spring of 2017, when Bezos did that. I mean, I don't know whether that was his worst move or deciding to set up a logistics business. <laughs> I, well, I, I mean, I, I, I've had this um, discussion with Benedict Evans. And I, I don't know if you know, he, he was the strategy partner at Andreessen Horowitz. And he's now moved back to London and he's, um, you know, in venture capital. But he's quite a big um, and authoritative commentator on, on tech. And I said, look, I'm I'm a transport analyst but the, the first sector that i looked at and you know this is a sector which is characterized by having a lot of assets very very asset intense intensive and very very low returns and uh, labor intensive and labor into i mean it's, it's intense everything intensive i, I just and, mentioned and, i just bet you unskilled labor prices are going through the roof in the united states of america and that logistics business of Amazon is completely dependent on hiring drivers and warehouse workers. And labor is going to win the next 10 to 20 years. Labor is going to win and physical assets are going to win. And companies that are dependent on, on, on labor and physical assets are going to lose. So do you, do you think that's going to be a massive um, drag for Bezos or his, his successor? I mean, do you think Amazon's going to struggle? Are you avoiding well, labor-intensive companies? Well, I, I, a guy I respect a great deal was on TV yesterday, uh, uh, Bill Nigren, uh, giving the bull case on Amazon. And, and here's what, what his team looked at. They comped AWS against what uh, other cloud stocks, and then they comped uh, a, 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 the rest of Amazon on a price to sales basis against other people selling stuff. And based on that, he views the stock as undervalued. Well, first of all, uh, part of that problem is all those other uh, cloud stocks are massively overpriced because of the mania that we've been going through for the last three years, which Charlie Munger called it the biggest mania of his career because of the totality of it. And what he means by that, we've effectively been doing the tulip mania and the South Seas bubble at the same time. Yes. Right. Right. That's what that that's we're, we're in a double whammy mania here. Okay? At least double. Yeah. At least at, maybe triple or quadruple. Yeah. It, it, we have we got a chart this last week that's uh, uh, going to be in our, our quarterly uh, newsletter and, and shareholder letter, and, and it shows, in effect, we're doing a triple dot com top is what we're doing. We're, 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 so the tulip mania is represented by crypto and Peloton and stuff like that, 
And, and then you got the South Sea bubble, which is the NVIDIA and the AI. That's the South Seas. That, that we're, we're inviting people to go and invest in companies in the South Seas so that uh, Isaac Newton can say, you know, I can understand, understand the heavenly bodies, but I, I can't understand the madness of crowds. And you couldn't speak about the South Seas bubble in his offices because he lost his fortune in the South Seas bubble. Uh, and, and, and here's the most brilliant man almost ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> he lost his rear end in a mania. And, and so, so, uh, so we, 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 uh, we, we love that. By the way, back to what you said about the concentration I meant to mention, but one of Cole's favorite quotes is we love Mae West. She had a lot of great quotes. She says, you know, too, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. Yes. No, I like that one. So just let's talk about the bubble because Druckenmiller, um, I got a quote from him here. There's a 500 year history of asset bubbles, well documented in The Price of Time, Edward Chancellor's new book, which I haven't yet read, but I feel very bad about. Every time you've had a significant asset bubble, economic trouble lay ahead. When you had 11 years of free money, people do stupid things. All you have to do is look at someone paid $80 billion for Dodge a coin, which was invented as a joke. That can only happen in the world of free money. But the fact that this is arguably the most disruptive economic period we've had since the late 1800s, and there were no bankruptcies, tells me there's a lot of stuff under the hood. So what are the consequences? So there's the consequences. There's the direct consequences that NVIDIA won't go up another trillion dollars and might go back to a more reasonable valuation. But there's also some real second order economic effects. What do you, I mean, how do you look at all this? Well, first we've been short coders and long carpenters for the last three years. <laughs> so so uh, what the antitrust world was supposed to do is gonna be done by the, the open market economics. Uh, you, you know, it, 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 uh, you, you want to short houses in Palo Alto, uh, and you want to go long houses in the suburbs of Kansas city. Uh, and, and, and there's just a long list of those pair trades right now that are going to make the, the, the sense you, you, you want to short labor intensive businesses, uh, that are, that employ a lot of, uh, low skilled labor, uh, and, and, and and you know it, it it's it's just very simple. Uh, we got a chart uh, in May of 2020 that showed that commodities were at a 220 year low relative to common stocks in the United States, and we literally pivoted. We we went to bed one night as Charlie Munger uh, find great companies through our eight criteria. Uh, at a reasonable price, people, we love to buy broken growth stocks. That, that's way easier life. And we said, we have got to learn how to be good Ben Graham investors. The world turned to Ben Graham when Sa Saudi Sunday hit and they cut the legs off the U.S. oil and gas industry. Commodities hit a 220 year low. By the way, the prior lows were 1825, 1875 and 1930. And this was a lower low than any of those three prior lows. So what it means is assets are, are, are going to be more valuable than intellectual property. It's easy to think about really when you think about the laws of supply and demand. Are there a lot of talented people trying to make the next great intellectual property? Yes. Are there a lot of talented people trying to poke holes in the ground to find uh, fossil fuels? No. Are the people who poke holes in the ground to find fossil fuels being politically shamed in the marketplace? Yes. Are they being ostracized? Yes. So let me tie this back into Philip Morris. People say, Bill, why are you so overweight in the oil and gas business? Well, let me tell you about Philip Morris. In 1970, the United States government, and by the way, I, I, I'm in favor of what they did. They took cigarette commercials off of television. They mandated federally, no more cigarette commercials, no more Marlboro Man on TV and radio. At that time, 42% of American adults were cigarette smokers. And by 40 years later, uh, we were down to 23%. 
The price of a pack of cigarettes in 1970 was 20 cents, five cents a tax, 15 cents for Philip Morris. In 2010, it was $5 a pack. $2.50 of federal, state, and local taxes and $2.50 for Philip Morris. Now, if you want to own a stock and you have a drop in adult customers from 42% of Americans to 23% of Americans, what do you think would happen to a stock that had that happen to them? Well, you'd think it's terrible, right? Oh, there's going to be all these electric cars. Nobody's going to want to put gasoline in their car. This is a terrible business. Why would you want to be in that business? Because the price of a package of cigarettes went up 16 fold. They didn't even lose half their clientele and got 16 times the price. It was the best performing stock on the New York Stock Exchange from 1970 to 2010. And, and Peter Lynch's largest position and was one of the reasons why he ended up being such a successful money manager. So, so we're in exactly that same position in oil and gas right now. The, the, the more they shame it, the more difficult they make it to poke holes in the ground, the, the, the more there's going to be an explosion in price. And, and uh, you can see it coming because there's only four ways to make electricity in the United States of America right now that are, that are allowed. That is wind, solar, uh, 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 natural gas, and sticking gasoline into turbines, which is what they do in California a lot. So uh, you could say geothermal, but they're not going to put a geothermal plant in Yellowstone Park, which is the best single place to get geothermal energy in the United States of America. So bottom line is we don't have nuclear. We don't want coal fired, right? We're not building new rivers and building new dams. So we don't care what you're going to use the fossil fuel energy for. It takes 60 barrels of oil to build a Tesla. Our favorite guy on this is Mark Mills, uh, written some great books. And, and uh, Mills points out the more technology you use, the more energy you use. And it's got to come from somewhere. So the beauty of it is we now own a stock like Oxy that is the new Philip Morris and Steve, they might just be the Amazon of the industry because they're going to be the most successful carbon capture company and their carbon capture business might end up being their AWS. The carbon capture business should be a, an amazing business. It slightly and, puzzles me why there hasn't been any proper research done on it because I can remember talking about this 15 years ago. And um, the UK government had a competition and they, you know, they, they just don't follow through. And it's so such, it's, such an, it's, it's such an obvious route to relieving some of our, our problems. The climate change is a, is a, is a massive, massive issue. But the, the, the fallout from the free money, uh, I mean, the one thing that strikes me is that if you're going to have less people employed in the tech sector, which seems to already be happening. If there's less venture capitalists deploying this idle money into stupid new ventures, then there's going to be a lot less money spent on software or not less money, but there isn't going to be the growth that's implied. Why do you think that people haven't sort of woken up to this? Uh, Steve, if, if I could hug you at, at a long distance, I'd hug you because when the whole Silicon Valley, uh, First Republic, and Signature Bank problems cropped up, I, I felt like I was the only person that, that was thinking about the second and third derivative effect of this. In effect, the free money disappearing is torpedoing this basically unbelievable uh, a binge in wealth creation out of nothing that comes from venture capital. And by the way, the institutional investors, they love to make money on things that the price doesn't get printed in the newspaper, right? They love private equity. They love structured finance. They love all these things that the price doesn't get printed in the newspaper or come up on their computer, right? So but why only, is that? It's mad, because, right? No, because it's out of sight, out of mind. So 
when the, the second derivative is if the venture capital thing kind of goes down the toilet as you can get real interest rates or, or get something in interest uh, and the risk come back into risk assets and the, the tortoise beats the hare, uh, what, what's going to happen is new businesses buy Apple machines to, to do their business. And they buy software and cloud services, and 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 and, and they and they buy advertising from Google and Facebook. The, the second and third derivative of this thing hasn't even begun to play out. And, yeah. and wait till wait till those stocks start turning sour. It, 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 when the publicly traded stocks turn sour, it, it, it's just going to be a cascading avalanche. It, it's it's going to be a nightmare. We we think. Uh, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the the, the RCA. Uh, you know, in, in the in, in 29, you had the radio business, the air, airplanes, and the automobile were the triple whammy, right? That was the, uh, you know, the dot com was the dot com bubble. So we've had we, we've got a tech bubble. We've now got an AI bubble. Uh, we, we, you know, we've had a high price to sales bubble. We've had a crypto bubble. We had a meme bubble. Uh, we have an IPO and SPAC bubble. That's what B Munger, you know, the totality of it all. Uh, there's going to be hell to pay, Steve. It, th there's going to be hell to pay. So the, the, uh, the history of common stock success over long duration, whether it be Buffett or Peter Lynch or whoever it was, it's a combination of making good selections on your own and avoiding the damage that comes from the fallout of regularly purging mania. And I, I thought we were going to purge it in 22. And, and literally this Hail Mary called AI. It, it, it's like you're, you're, you're down a goal in the, in, in the football game in, in Liverpool, and you take a 70 meter shot to try to tie the game. That's what AI is. It's a 70 meter shot in the football game. And, 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 and well, in, in foot, in American football, it's a 60 yard pass from Doug Flutie to Gerald Whalen to win the game for Boston college. It's the most famous hail Mary. That's what this AI is. It's an attempt to revive a bubble that needs to die. It, it, it's the, it's like, it's the worst possible medicine for the, for the patient. It, it's just a, a nightmare. I mean, I think, you know, like all these things, it's got a vein of truth to it, which is uh -huh. they, they, there has to be some vein of truth to it. But what yeah. what interests me is if you could just share your experience about eBay, I think it was, you bought <laughs> way after the dot-com boom. Because it's just, it's just interesting to get somebody with your experience and your perspective. Because, and I don't necessarily agree with you that, you know, Google won't get, it won't get the same growth in advertising from all these startups. Of course it won't. But there's, there, you know, there, it's got a secular trend where it's capturing shares. So, you know, there, there's nuances. But what I think people often underestimate is just the time lags in the system. Yeah. And so many yes. people listening to this will say, oh, we had the bear market in 22. Tech had the bear market. It's all over. We're all back to the races. Yeah. And yeah. it's not that simple. No. With eBay. Uh, so, so in 99, my poster child that I made fun of was a, 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 a guy would go on eBay. He'd buy a once used Callaway driver, uh, a big Bertha, they called it at the time. And he'd pay, he'd pay 50 cents on the uh, brand new dollar. And the thing had been used once. And then he'd turn around, buy 300 shares of the stock and it would go up 10% the first week he owned the stock. It was a spectacular stock. So to your point, Steve, the internet will change our lives. That was the nugget, right? The internet will change our lives. They were right. They lost their rear end. I mean, they got slaughtered. Everybody that bought that line in 1999 got slaughtered. So I made fun of eBay. But you know what? I, I, I really liked the business they had created. They, they are the New York Stock Exchange of garage sales. That's what they are, uh, pre-owned and new but not wanted goods 
get bought and sold. They run 24 and a half percent margins. And guess what? They don't have any. They don't have any logistics expense. They don't pay the logistics. The seller pays the logistics, right? So they they run five times the margins that Amazon's e-commerce uh, business does, which allows them to make money. Well, so we bought eBay in 08 and, uh, and, and here's what's funny. We just had a call this week. We were checking in on PayPal because we automatically owned PayPal because we got a two for one split of PayPal and an eBay share in 2015. And we phased out of it. I think our last sales were like $150 on, on PayPal. It went to 270 or some ungodly number. And we, we, we so we thought we better find out what's going on there. And, uh, we're not doing anything with it at the moment, but we just thought it'd be good to. So it, we we think eBay is a terrific business, and so I, I remember in November of uh, of uh, 2008, it was it was not the final low, but it was a super low point. Thanksgiving of 08, it wasn't the ultimate bottom in March of 09, but a a, a broker friend of ours uh, and his family came over and had Thanksgiving dinner with us. And I took him into my, my den. And of course I had get my buck kicked, right? I, 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 we started our fund the second trading day of 08. And I literally got slaughtered for the first 14 months that we were a public vehicle, literally slaughtered. And so, but I was already bullish because the right ingredients were being thrown into the pot, right? Uh, the fed was friendly. Everybody hated stocks. Uh, you know, Buffett was saying buy American. I am, I, I had, I had all the, so anyway, so I took him in the den and I walked him through the value line, which by the way, is my primary resource for stock selection for our eight criteria. I walked him through the value line. So, okay, here's the stock. eBay was $11. They had $3 in cash, no debt. They owned a hundred percent of PayPal, a hundred percent of StubHub, 30% of Skype and five of the six largest classified advertising uh, e-commerce, uh, classified ad businesses in the world, foreign language, uh, e-commerce. E and, and, uh, so, so here's, what's funny. They sold 30% of Skype for more than the other 70% sold to Microsoft who, when Steve Ballmer running it, uh, you know, Microsoft, when you sit down at the poker game and you don't know who the sucker was, it, it, it was always Microsoft, right? They bought Nokia, they bought Avenue Q, they bought, they, they, you know, they bought Skype. I mean, they, they were the sucker in the room always. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so between the average cost, of, uh, we sold uh, PayPal uh, alone. We got about 11 times our money on eBay from that uh, November $11 of 08 price. Uh, and we still own uh, eBay at 45 on that 11. So uh, it, 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 uh, it ended up being a lot of fun. So back to your point. Uh, uh, Andy Grove said the best, uh, 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 business advice he ever got was from his, uh, city college of New York professor. He says, when everyone knows that something is so nobody knows nothing. So if everybody gets excited about AI, you, you, th that's going to breed a tremendous amount of grief. No, I'm sure that I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that's right. Listen, I could go on for much longer, but I know you've got a fund to run and um, you've got a busy day ahead. I normally ask people if they could recommend a book or a couple of books to a young person coming into the industry. Well, you're obviously you love books as well. So yeah. I'm curious to hear what your what your recommendations would be. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you exactly the same thing. I tell all the young people when they ask me that question, I get that question a lot. I recommend the Bible, John Kenneth Galbraith's short history of financial euphoria. Uh, you can read that book today. It's 125 pages. It takes about two and a half for three hours to read, depending on how fast you read. And you'll think he just wrote it last week. Uh, it was last updated in 1990. And of course, uh, Ben Graham's intelligent investor. Uh, those three books. The, the, that's what I recommend to all the young people. And let me tell you, at the moment, uh, a, a short history of financial euphoria, you better start there because it, it, it just such a great job of explaining why 
investor, most investors that own common stock right now over the next 10 years are likely to fail miserably. And, and that's true whether they own an index fund or not. Because we think that we think the index, the S and P five hundred index, will run nominal negative returns over the next ten years, and and on an inflation adjusted basis, will run very negative real returns over the next ten years. Much like, you, you know, not, end of ninety nine to to end of 09. Same, okay, same I, kind I of. I can't let you go without exploring that. But before exploring that, I just wanted to ask you why the Bible. Well, it 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 it, uh, it it's just the foundation of 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 everything. Uh, it it's it's um, it's it's my own personal worldview. Uh, it, it is based on the truths in the Bible. And, and by the way, again, Robert Sirico wrote that book I mentioned to you about the economics of the parables. Uh, he does a great job of flushing out how much much great economic wisdom. There are, it's just fantastic the way he flushes that out. Very real time, common sense and useful ways of thinking about economics. We'll, we'll link that in the show notes. But the this idea, the S&P is going to have a negative return over the next 10 years. And I have to say, I don't, I mean, real terms, I definitely don't disagree with you. I don't, nominal, I'm not not sure. And I, but I'd just like to briefly explore that with you because I'm, I think people have underestimated inflation and in the past inflation has been bad for equities. Is that the yeah. reason? Well, that's one of the reasons. Uh, too many people with too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, we're in a commodity super cycle that started a couple of years ago. The other commodity super cycles were 1971 to 1981 and 1999 to 2000 and eight or 11, depending on which way you look at it. So what was the 1971 was too many baby boomers, a 75% larger population group than the silent generation behind them, uh, with too much uh, federal government borrowed money to fight the Vietnam War and do Johnson's Great Society that got monetized, uh, chasing too few goods the moment the Arabs embargoed oil. and. The uh, uh, 1999 to 2011 was too many Chinese people with too much money chasing too few goods, right? We dug up Western Australia, put it on a barge and took it over to China to build condo buildings. Uh, and, and it put tremendous pressure on, on commodity prices during that time period. This time it's too many millennials with too much money. This time. Well, listen, um, Bill, it's been absolutely fascinating, amazing listening to you. I hope that next time you're over in London, we're going to get a few beers together because I think that will be great fun. It's been great fun talking to you. And um, thank you very much for coming on the show. Th thanks for having us. Uh, just really appreciate you. Well, I could have chatted for longer with Bill if he didn't have a very busy day ahead of him in Arizona. I really enjoyed our discussion, particularly his analysis of US demographics and how the wave of millennials entering a peak spending period will provide some excellent opportunities in stocks. They may also help support the US economy to a greater extent than I'd realized. You can find Bill at smedcap.com, S-M-E-A-D-C-A-P.com. Thanks as ever for listening. Please share with all your friends. Please follow us. And if you can, leave a five-star rating in Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And if you're that way inclined, the podcast is now also available on our YouTube channel. See you next time. Thank you for listening. I'm Steve Clapham. That was the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and why not visit our website, behindthebalancesheet.com, where you can find the show notes and lots of other videos which can help you on your investing journey. Thank you for watching.